For our last mini lecture on Chapter 9, we're going to be covering learning outcomes 9 6 and 9 7, and both will receive light treatment. 9 6 is about intangible assets, and we spoke briefly about those at the beginning of this chapter in our first mini lecture. They're long lived assets, which means we expect to use them longer than a year, that lack physical substance. Their existence is indicated by legal documents. Um, and they include such items as trademarks, patents, copyrights, and such. Some long-term, I apologize, long-lived intangible assets have limited lives, and if so, they depreciate and wear out, except we don't call it depreciation, we call it amortization. So amortization is like depreciation, but we're using a different name because it's a different type of asset. So amortization is the using up of an intangible asset. It's calculated using the straight line method. Um, we debit amortization expense and credit accumulated amortization, very similar to our depreciation entry. If an intangible asset has an unlimited life, then it is not depreciated or amortized. And I'd like to refer you to page 411 in your textbook. You can look at this on your e-text if you don't have hard copy text, or you can take a look at it in SmartBook. Um, just a quick review of the type of intangible assets, because all I'm going to expect you to do in this portion of the chapters to be able to recognize intangible assets and the fact that we call the wearing out of intangible assets amortization. Okay, our first example is a trademark. It's a special name, image, slogan identified with a product or company. Um, for example, Kleenex, Jell-O, McDonald's, the Sabres. These can be renewed indefinitely, so they have an unlimited life, which means it will not get amortized. Copyrights give the owner the exclusive right to publish, use, and sell a literary, musical, artistic, or dramatic work for a period not exceeding 70 years after the author's death. An example of this is the Happy Birthday Song. Until just a little while ago, you were not able to sing the song in public. Let me just show you this little story I got on a calendar that someone had given to me. It says, according to historians, the musical accompaniment to many a cake eating and candle extinguishing was published in England for the first time by Clayton Sonny in 1924. The song had been in print for a dozen years beforehand, but none of those printers, unluckily for them, thought to copyright it. Of course, once published, royalties were due whenever it was sung in public. Movie makers and radio broadcasters wanting to avoid the fee would revert back to the old classic for He's a Jolly Good Fellow, uh, another favorite birthday anthem. Happy Birthday to You is still copyrighted, but there's a birthday candle light at the end of the tunnel. The current European Union copyright is set to expire at the end of 2016. Now, of course, we're in 2020 now, so it's off copyright, and you can sing Happy Birthday as much as you want in public. So copyrights have a limited life, but we are going to amortize that over the time we expect to use it, its useful life. Patents are an exclusive right granted by the federal government to the patent owner that prevents others from using, manufacturing, or selling the patented item for 20 years. So there's the use, there's the limit. However, the useful life may be different. For example, for pharmaceuticals, some medication we expect to only be profitable for a certain number of years before an alternative is developed. Um, the same thing with technology products like Apple. Um, they may amortize the design for the current iPhone for perhaps only three to five years because they expect to produce another one and um, then have and then not use that one to produce any more iPhones. Technology assets include software and web development work. Those we amortize over three to seven years. Licensing rights. Um, for example, our college buys licenses for us to use Microsoft Office products on campus. And so you would amortize that over the time period that the license covers. 
Franchises are contractual rights to sell certain products or services, use certain trademarks, or perform certain activities in a geographical region, like Krispy Kreme, Tim Hortons, McDonald's, uh, Burger King. Uh, and then, of course, we have Goodwill, which we talked about earlier. Um, and Goodwill is the extra money paid over the market value of the assets when one company buys another. The company developing the goodwill never has the goodwill they developed on their records because it can't be measured. It's only when another company is willing to buy the first company for more than the market value of the assets that we have goodwill that we can record and it goes on the books of the buyer. What about purchasing intangibles? Well, if you buy them, you would debit the asset account for whatever the purchase price would be, including all costs necessary to purchase it. However, if they are internally developed, we do not debit an asset account. We, we call those research and development expenses. The last topic is our fixed asset turnover ratio, and I didn't give you any problems on this, so I'm just going to briefly review the ratio. This ratio measures or evaluates how well management uses long-lived tangible assets to generate revenue. And what we do is take our net revenue, which if we're talking about sales, it would be less returns and allowances and less discounts because we have the word net there. And we divide by our average net fixed assets. And your fixed assets are your long-lived tangible assets. Now why do we say net here? Net means we subtract something and what we subtract from our long-lived tangible assets is accumulated depreciation. So you have to average out your net fixed assets, your assets less accumulated depreciation. If you don't have any more data than year-end data, you would take the end of last year plus the end of this year, add them together and divide by two to get the average. And that concludes our lectures for Chapter 9.